Good morning, First Unitarian. I chose the topic of persistent illusions some time ago, before George Floyd was murdered, before the last 12 days of protests in cities across the country, before those peaceful protests were hijacked by anarchists and white supremacists intent on violence and property destruction, before the president threatened to use the military against citizen protesters, and before the other set of videos came out showing the police using tear gas and riot gear and deliberately driving vehicles into protesters and other obvious examples of unnecessary force. All of which, frankly, only persuaded me to change the emphasis, but not the subject of persistent illusions that I want to talk about this morning. The subject is myth and mythologies their power and their persistence, because myths, like anything that is very powerful, can also be very dangerous. And because I believe much of what we are seeing in our world right now can be helpfully framed through a mythic lens, if you will. That statement may need a little explanation. So let's get a definition out of the way. The philosopher Sam Keen wrote this. Myth refers to an intricate set of interlocking stories, rituals, rites, and customs that inform and give a pivotal sense of meaning and direction to a person, family, community, or culture. Notice that the essence of this definition has to do with stories that we tell about ourselves, mostly to ourselves, and from which form the lenses of, that color how we perceive the world. Notice that nowhere in that definition is there any mention of objective truth, because that's not what this is about. Typically, the stories we tell about ourselves, to ourselves, have a kernel of truth to them, and then the rest gets filled in and embellished with virtues and virtuosity that exist mostly in our heads. I believe a great deal of the confusion and overreaction to ongoing protests are precisely because the protests expose the lie of American exceptionalism and individualism, which all of us have been taught and indoctrinated into to one degree or another. In fact, every book, study, and article I could find about this listed individualism as the first and most defining characteristic of American culture or American mythology, if you will, and said that every other defining characteristic of American culture flows out of this one. American assumptions, assumptions for example, about Competition and privacy and equality and freedom and security and property ownership and the uh, quality of life and family and how we raise our children and how we educate them. All of these are subsets, if you will, or flow out of this profound, mostly unexamined valuing of individualism, the supreme individual self. Maybe the epitome of this cultural assumption uh, is given expression in the beautiful song, and it is a beautiful song, America the Beautiful. Here's the second verse. I can't make this up. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern impassioned stress, a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. Let's be blunt. It's pretty hard to square that vision of America with the genocide of indigenous people, with centuries of slavery and systemic racism, 
with being the most warlike nation on the face of the earth, with having more incarcerated people, both in total and per capita than any other country on earth, by having refugee children in cages, George Floyd being murdered on the street by armed policemen in broad daylight, tens of thousands of people marching in the street calling for systemic changes being tear gassed and curfewed. Social scientists have begun to study how the rates of American depression and loneliness and mental illness may result from exactly this cultural individualism being at odds with genetic and biological needs as determined by you know, the last two million years of human evolution. Many have argued that Individualism is our great strength, and that individualism is why America has been so successful relative to other countries and regions for the past couple hundred years. And maybe that's true, but at what cost? What if we paid for all that so-called progress? And even if there is some truth there, I suggest, I suggest that what happens with any strength over time, any strength at all, over time, becomes a weakness. Andrew Basevich and other thinkers have written convincingly that the ideal of American freedom, for all practical purposes in this day and age, has, uh, has transformed into mere materialism, which is to say we've come to effectively confuse political, social, educational, and spiritual freedom with the freedom to buy stuff and acquire stuff and to live beyond our means, which I think is a pretty strong argument. The evidence, I think, is all around us. Just one of the, one of the effects of this confusion, especially in an economic system that is so thoroughly rigged to favor the already wealthy, is that entire communities are simply and effectively excluded, not only from wealth, but from freedom itself. I don't know about you, but that sounds way more like weakness to me than strength. Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker, whom I like to quote, wrote this, Our times demand that we think in other ways about the relationship between the individual and the community. The limits of a merely individualistic understanding of human existence are pressing upon us. Our attachment to an economic system that maximizes self-interest has broken our covenant with the earth and with one another. It is important that we do this. Multiple oppressions that our hearts cry out against, racism, sexism, the neglect of children, the abuse of the environment, intersect in an economic system in which the bottom line is individual self-interest. I'm not saying all myths are bad or even that myths can be avoided. Myths help us make sense of a world that is beyond our comprehension. People like Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and many others would say, we couldn't live without myths even if we tried. I am saying, and I think tens of thousands of protesters are saying, that it's time to take a hard, sober look at the world that our persistent illusions of individualism and exceptionalism has created. Take a hard, sober look at the real cost of keeping and enforcing those illusions and begin to imagine a different kind of a world, maybe fed by myths that connect instead of isolate, that truly honor the sacred worth of every person instead of money and material gain, and don't sort people out for different treatment by race, class, gender, nationality, or immigration status. 
So why am I bringing all this to church? To this beloved spiritual community? Two reasons. First, as I said last week, I continue to believe that this transformation is first and foremost a spiritual transformation. It will be created and led and worked for by people who have come to see through the illusion of individualism to the unity that makes us one. Who have grown in their understanding, their internalization of interdependence, or in the words of Martin Luther King, who understand that none of us are free until all of us are free. That, if you can get there, that is spiritual maturity. And secondly, I continue to believe that, first uni that Unitarian Universalism and First Unitarian Denver have a valuable and needed voice in this larger conversation, in that sober assessment, in that visioning of a new world, in that desperately needed transformation. And I am glad to be in this with you, my friends. Amen. In the next few minutes, as the music plays, you are invited to type your thoughts and reflections into the chat box. There will be a couple of questions on your screen. I wish you peace and courage and rest.